the Nelson Mandela Foundation would like to announce the introduction of three new members of its board of trustees. Professor Chilidzi Marwala, Ms. Judith February, and Ms. Alice Brown. Professor Chilidzi Marwala is the Vice Chancellor and Principal of the University of Johannesburg. He holds a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering, magna cum laude, from Case Western Reserve University, a Master of Mechanical Engineering from the University of Pretoria, and a PhD specializing in Artificial Intelligence and Engineering from the University of Cambridge. He has published 14 books on artificial intelligence, one of them having been translated into Chinese, over 300 papers in journals, proceedings, book chapters, and magazines, and he holds four patents. Ms. Judith February is a lawyer, governance specialist, and columnist. She is a visiting fellow at the Witz School of Governance. She studied at the University of Cape Town, where she obtained her BA degree, majoring in law and Latin, LLB degree, and LLM in commercial law. Ms. February has worked extensively on issues of good governance, transparency and accountability within the South African context. Her areas of focus include corruption and its impact on governance, parliamentary oversight and institutional design. Alice Al Brown is the head of Sojourner Tubman Walls and Co Consulting and a visiting research fellow at the African Center for the Study of the United States located at the University of the Witwatersrand. A graduate of New York University School of Law, JD, and Dartmouth College BA History, Ms. Brown is committed to the use of the law for the public good. Currently, she advises, speaks, and writes on a broad range of topics, including philanthropic giving, nonprofit organization governance, leadership development, organizational effectiveness, public interest law, and transformation within the South African legal profession. We are honored to have them serve on our board of trustees and to be guided by their expertise and wisdom. Today we inaugurate the first annual Nelson Mandela Lecture. The lecture is part of a series of events being held this week to celebrate Nelson Mandela, the person and his contribution in creating a better world. The Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture will be developed as a prestigious public lecture attracting the best intellectual voices in the world. It will add to the larger public dialogue on critical social issues. The purpose of launching the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture is twofold. First, it will be an occasion to celebrate Nelson Mandela's legacy. Secondly, it will provide a forum for the critical consideration of challenging social issues that confront us in the 21st century. On this day, on every day, let us be inspired by Nelson Mandela, the truly symbol of human greatness. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the very first virtual Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. Wherever you are in South Africa and in other parts of the world, I bring you greetings from the trustees and staff of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Avusheni, Nyan Vusela, San Bonani, Chobela, Dumelang, Lochani, Huyedach, Molweni, Sanbona, Nda. My name is 
Nelson Lohatang, and I'm the CEO of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. I greet you all of South Africa, in all of South Africa's uh, official languages as a statement of solidarity in times of dislocation, disruption, and rupture. I'm confident that the Secretary General Guterres will have much more to say about the importance of solidarity globally. Friends, we live in momentous times. COVID-19 has brought with it a sense of both peril and promise. It has exposed in cruel ways what human societies had come to normalize, inequality, racism, and ecological depredation. It has taken many lives and destroyed many more, and it is calling us to change human behaviors fundamentally. In this context, it is perfectly timely that we have the United Nations Secretary General as our speaker and perfectly appropriate that the title of the lecture is Tackling the Inequality Pandemic, a New Social Contract for a New Era. Friends, as I'm sure you all know, earlier this week, we lost the youngest daughter of Nelson Mandela and Winnie Madigizela Mandela, Usis Zinzi Mandela. We are in mourning for a special human being who was always there for us. We dedicate the 18th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture to her memory. Like her mother, she was a fighter. She had resilience and she cared about people, especially the excluded and the discarded. These are all qualities we will need as we face the challenge of COVID-19 and the bigger challenge of building a transformative post-COVID world. The only way we can beat this virus is to work together in solidarity. And with that, we are also pleased to announce that the Nelson Mandela Foundation, in partnership with One Campaign and MTB Vase, a base, will be launching a COVID-19 anthem today with 10 of Africa's biggest musical artists that will be played at the end of today's proceedings. And now, as we pause for the singing of South Africa's national anthem, I also want to note the loss of another Mandela in law and Mosele family member in this week, Nkono Ana Khadikainyana Mosele, as well as Senator John Lewis, our thoughts are with their families. Your loss is also ours. Please join me in the singing of the South African National Anthem.
before we continue with the proceedings, we want to share with you a short tribute to Sis Zinzi Mandela, courtesy of Anand Singh and Video Vision. We came to know her as a friend and we will always miss her. My mother tried getting us into schools in Soweto and the black principal then were very scared of police harassment. They were afraid to take us because one or two had already experienced, you know, uh, harassment from the security police for having us there. Then we had to use, you know, we changed our surnames and my mother took us to, you know, a colored school um, in town. And there as well, the security police caught up with, you know, with us and, you know, had us kicked out of their school. And this went on and on in about six or seven schools here in South Africa, in town, you know, where we were just chucked out, you know, we wouldn't even spend a month with the kicked out, you know, um, until such time that some friends of my mother's heard about our plight and then they offered to have us educated in Swaziland. Knowing Mama's strength and charisma and her determination, tremendous respect that I have for her, her strength as a woman, that she was able to be a single parent and she was able to put a smile on her face, always hold her head up high. We never saw her fall apart. My father says, I cannot and will not give any undertaking at a time when I and you, the people, are not free. Your freedom and mine cannot be separated. I will return. Amanda! A letter that he wrote to me that I obviously didn't get, where he was analyzing my poetry and so on. It was such a, it was very touching, it was quite emotional. It, it is like some kind of uh, personal comfort uh, that at least the world recognizes the sacrifices that he's made, that he wasn't able to father us for many years, that he, when he was incarcerated, he suffered many losses whilst in prison, personal losses, but he still came out to be a man of peace and reconciliation. I'm glad that that is being documented and shared and that people continue to celebrate his life. I think it's very important for us like, to try to help implement his vision for South Africa, for for South African children, for the youth in general, for the world, for everybody to realize. You know, like now, I think that the saying is like, it's in your hands. That's what the legacy institutions are saying. That's what he has said, I'm handing over. I think it's so important, you know, for us just to, you know, let go, let him be. I would do it all again. I can't imagine, that's all I've known. Everything else is just, a, is just a fantasy. And what I've learned from this is to define myself, not according to uh, what I've suffered, the, the anguish and so on, but according to how I've survived that. And I think it's an important uh, lesson, especially um, as in my capacity as a mother, as a grandmother, it's very important for me to be able to demonstrate that type of resilience and ability to see um, to have a more holistic approach to life for the sake of my children, especially during difficult times.
Thank you very much. Um, it is now my singular honor to introduce to you President Cyril Ramaphosa. He has contributed a pre-recorded message for this occasion in the midst of what is a punishing schedule. But of course, for South Africans, when you see the president on TV, you never know what he will be bringing. He could easily be bringing back Pusa Thursday and cigarettes, or he could be sending us back straight to our homes. He has also mastered the art of confusing us with his greetings. We thought we worked out. When he says this, it means we're back home. When he, now it's very confusing. I should tell you that earlier today, he and Sia and Rachel Colisi joined me in a Mandela Day activation at a Soweto orphanage, Ikacheng. Again, S is his want. He demonstrated that he believes in the call to make every day a Mandela Day. He listens to the views and the demands of society's most vulnerable, most vulnerable people and works tirelessly to find ways of doing differently in times that demand change. He keeps reminding us that the South Africa which will emerge after COVID-19 will not be the South Africa of 2019. The world will be a new world, which will demand imagination and commitment from all of us. I always feel encouraged whenever I spend time with him, for he has both these qualities and a steely determination to find a way. Let us listen to his words to us today. I greet you on behalf of the people of South Africa. I would like to thank the United Nations and the international community for the great honor they've bestowed on our icon, Nelson Mandela. This year's International Mandela Day is tinged with sadness. It is with profound sorrow that we received the sad news of the passing of Zinzi Mandela, the youngest daughter of President Nelson Mandela and Winima Digizela Mandela. Zinzi Mandela was a brave activist when her father was in prison and endured the hardships of banishment and harassment. After democracy, she served her country and her people with distinction as South Africa's ambassador to Denmark. We are all saddened by her passing. On the 18th of July every year, we celebrate Nelson Mandela's life. His was a life lived in the service of others. We celebrate the triumph of the human spirit over adversity. On this day, we are all called upon to perform 67 minutes of service in memory of a man who believed that just one small act of kindness can make the world of difference in the lives of others. Nelson Mandela was undoubtedly one of the greatest leaders of our time. He was a hero of South Africa's liberation struggle, but he was not ours alone. He belonged to peace-loving and freedom-loving peoples all over the world. His commitment to advancing freedom made him the father of not just our nation, but of every nation. His legacy in fighting apartheid is all the more relevant today. Across the world, people are rising and taking a firm stance against racism, injustice, and inequality. In his memory, we must strive all the harder to build societies that are rooted in mutual respect, tolerance, and reconciliation. This year, we celebrate International Mandela Day in the shadow of a global pandemic. Coronavirus has devastated the lives of many people and the livelihoods of societies across the world. Yet, inspired by Mandela's spirit of compassion and care, this pandemic has revived the bonds of solidarity amongst nations of the world. The outpouring of goodwill has been on a scale rarely witnessed in modern times. 
the goodwill and solidarity has manifested itself through donations of diagnostics and therapeutic medical supplies, as well as food parcels to those who are in need. Our acts of care and solidarity should also deepen our collaboration to address humankind's most pressing challenges. Better education, eliminating poverty and underdevelopment, food security, climate change and gender-based violence. The UN Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, will address the Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture on tackling the inequality pandemic, a new social contract for a new era. This is a theme that goes to the heart of the immense task that lies before us. Even as we live in these troubled times, it was Nelson Mandela who taught us to remain courageous and to persevere. We have it within us to rise above the devastation brought about by this pandemic. I wish everyone a meaningful International Mandela Day. Thank you. We thank you, President Ramaphosa, for this reflection, for encouragement to keep working hard in testing times, and for your reminder that the legacy of Madiba is a living one. The chairman of the Nelson Mandela Foundation's Board of Trustees has also contributed a pre-recorded message for today. Professor Njabulo Ndebele was appointed as a trustee 21 years ago by Nelson Mandela and is the only remaining founding trustee. We draw heavily on his wise counsel, his probing analysis, and his calm in a storm. Needless to say, these are attributes which have been called on more than ever in this time of COVID-19. I send warm greetings from the Nelson Mandela Foundation to all our audiences in South Africa and around the world. On the day Nelson Mandela was born, 102 years ago, on behalf of the Foundation's Board of Trustees and staff, I thank you for supporting the 18th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture with your participation from wherever you are in the world. Although we are unable to host Secretary General Antonio Guterres in South Africa in person, we warmly embrace the historical moment of the very first virtual Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. As we ponder the emergence of fresh realities in the world in the light of the receding relevance of old ones, it is significant that our distinguished guest, the Secretary General of the United Nations, will address us on the theme, Tackling the Inequality Pandemic a new social contract for a new era. Since our 13th annual lecture in 2015, when Professor Thomas Piketty showed how structural inequality was As a legacy passed on from one generation to the next, amplified their structural infirmities and illnesses. It has amplified injustice, sectarianism, racism, casteism, and above all, class inequality. 
the historic implications of this moment are that both within countries and between continents, the historic insidiousness of the inequality pandemic has emerged clearly in the face of the centuries old ideology of white supremacy and the racism that gave birth to it. For many decades in South Africa, white supremacy was crudely displayed on the false pedestal of racial pride. Many people of goodwill around the world supported the oppressed South Africans to bring down that pedestal. It should never be forgotten that the anti-apartheid struggle was an international movement. It brought together many people around the world who believed in the dignity of all people. At the time, many powerful countries in the world cheered and, and appeared to condemn apartheid all at once. They got richer and richer while the victims of white supremacy in South Africa and those in other struggling countries around the world got poorer and poorer. The legacy of cheering and condemning still lives with us in the form of what Piketty calls the global inequality regime. While corporate elites around the world have sought to render such a regime normal, the global crisis of COVID-19 and the public killing of George Floyd have combined to reveal with dramatic effect the resilient and deadly connection between structural wealth and structural poverty. It is a connection that has shaped global trade and the politics of the management of that trade for some 500 years. An opportunity has come for the peoples of the world to remake not only the internal order within their respective countries, but also the global order through a shared understanding that in the new ethics of the global order, business cannot be separated from the necessity to uphold at the same time the shared human dignity of all people involved in the creation and management of the economies of the world. Vast profits can no longer be made at the expense of the vast majority of the peoples of the world. In his new book, Capital and Ideology, Piketty argues that dismantling the inequality regime is unimaginable without transnational justice and a move towards what he calls global federalism. The various forms of nationalist and identitarian retreats, which we see gathering pace across the world, will undermine fundamentally attempts to agree on a new social contract and to build a new world order. Nelson Mandela had the prescience to anticipate this very moment, both in its technical and its human features. This is what he said. In a world in which technology and communication have shortened the space between erstwhile prohibitively distant lands where outdated beliefs and imaginary differences among people were being rapidly eradicated, where exclusiveness was giving way to cooperation and interdependence, we too found ourselves obliged to share our narrow outlook and adjust to fresh realities. Who better to speak to this challenge and to interpret for us this moment than the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres? We are grateful to you, sir, for accepting our invitation and to your office 
for enabling you to give the lecture in extraordinary circumstances. We have followed closely Mr. Guterres's leadership of the UN through these months of COVID-19. And so too have we appreciated the work of other global organizations, such as the World Health Organization, and the enormous sense of responsibility they have shown in providing global leadership through the sketches of COVID-19. There can be no better time than to reaffirm the importance of such global organizations as the United Nations Organization. We in South Africa, of course, have followed Mr. Guterres's career across much longer trajectories. We remember his support for the anti-apartheid movement, his role in building a post-dictatorship and post-colonial order in Portugal, and his many contributions to building cultures of international cooperation. We are grateful for his unstinting promotion of the Nelson Mandela International Day from the moment he became UN Secretary General. How appropriate that he delivers the 18th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture on the 18th of July this year. This alone will give Mandela Day 2020 a very special quality. It is with a great sense of anticipation that I, on behalf of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, our trustees and staff, and our friends and guests around the world, warmly welcome UN Secretary General, Mr. Guterres, to this platform to address us. Thank you very much, uh, Prof. Prof, what you do, we're not seeing is that uh, we're getting so many messages of people, where do we connect? How do we get the lecture? So please go to www.nelsonmandela.org so that you can then watch the lecture. I think you will agree with me that in just a few minutes, Professor Njabul Ndebele has provoked our thinking, set the stage for our annual lecture deliberations and introduced our annual lecturer. Not that the UN Secretary General really needs an introduction. Both the position he occupies and the work he has been doing are well known across the world. I was privileged to meet him in person for the first time in New York in 2018, where I experienced his hospitality and was exposed directly to his passion for justice. Back then, I expressed a wish and a dream that he could one day address us as the Nelson Mandela Foundation. Little did we know that two years later, he is doing precisely that. During COVID-19, he has excelled as a global leader, a trusted voice in us uncertain times. And again and again, the World Health Organization has risen to the challenge. He is a leader who reaches beyond the imperative simply to protect human rights by demanding of us that we all strive to make just societies. The Secretary General was meant to join us in South Africa at Northwest University as part of a visit, but unfortunately, due to the pandemic, was not able to make it. I thought of him a couple of weeks ago when I encountered a young woman with Women for Girls here in Johannesburg who had lost her sight due to diabetes complications and could not access simple procedure which would restore her sight, Mabel Maleka. We, together with Women for Girls, did what needed to be done to protect her rights. And with the help of a caring medical team, led by Dr. Tebo Homaleka, her side was restored. But it can't be right that vulnerable people depend on acts of charity to enjoy the basic, 
the basic benefits and services. How do we create a society in which a young woman like Mabel Maleka not only receives what is her right, but also thrives as a human being and fulfills all her dreams and potential? Secretary General, I know that your lecture will speak to this question. I know that you will inspire us to keep working for that vision. We can't wait to hear from you. Over to you, sir. My dear friends, President Cyril Ramaphosa, Excellencies, distinguished guests, friends. It is a privilege to join you in honoring Nelson Mandela, an extraordinary global leader, advocate, and role model. I thank the Nelson Mandela Foundation for this opportunity and commend their work to keep his vision alive. And I send my deepest condolences to the Mandela family and to the government and people of South Africa on the untimely passing of Ambassador Zinzi Mandela earlier this week. May she rest in peace. I was fortunate enough to meet Nelson Mandela several times. I will never forget his wisdom, determination, and compassion, which shone forth in everything he said and did. Last August, in my holidays, I visited Mandiba's Mandiba cell at Robben Island. I stood there, looking through the bars, humbled again by his enormous mental strength and incalculable courage. Nelson Mandela spent 27 years in prison, 18 of them at Robben Island. But he never allowed this experience to define him or his life. Nelson Mandela rose above his jailers to liberate millions of South Africans and become a global inspiration and a modern icon. He devoted his life to fighting the inequality that has reached crisis proportions around the world in recent decades and that poses a growing threat to our future. And so today, on Madiba's birthday, I will talk about how we can address the many mutual reinforcing strands and layers of inequality before they destroy our economies and societies. Dear friends, COVID-19 is shining a spotlight on this injustice. The world is in turmoil, economies are in free fall, and we have been brought to our knees by a microscopic virus. The pandemic has demonstrated the fragility of our world. It has laid bare risks we have ignored for decades, inadequate health systems, gaps in social protection, structural inequalities, environmental degradation, the climate crisis. Entire regions that were making progress on eradicating poverty and narrowing inequality have been set back years in a matter of months. The virus poses the greatest risk to the most vulnerable, those living in poverty, older people, and people with disabilities and pre-existing conditions. And health workers are on the front lines with more than 4,000 infected in South Africa alone. I pay tribute to them. In some countries, health inequalities are amplified as not just private hospitals, but businesses and even individuals are ordering precious equipment that is urgently needed for everyone. A tragic example of inequality. The economic fallout of the pandemic is affecting those who work in the informal economy, small and medium-sized businesses, and people with caring responsibilities who are mainly women. We face the deepest global recession since World War II and the broadest collapse in incomes since 1870. 100 million more people would be pushed into extreme poverty and we could see famines of historic proportions. COVID-19 has been likened to an X-ray, revealing fractures in the fragile skeleton of the societies we have built. It is exposing fallacies, now falsehoods, everywhere. The lie that free markets can deliver health care for all. The fiction that unpaid care work is not work. The delusion that we live in a post-racist world. The myth that we are all in the same boat. Because while we are all floating on the same sea, it is clear that some are in super yachts, with others are clinging to drifting debris. Dear friends, inequality defines our time. 
more than 70% of the world's people are living with rising income and wealth inequality. The 26 richest people in the world hold as much wealth as half the global population. But income, pay, and wealth are not the only measures. It defines our time. More than 70% of the world's people are living with rising income and wealth inequality. The 26 richest people in the world hold as much wealth as half the global population. But income, pay, and wealth are not the only measures. of inequality. People's chances in life depend on their gender, family and ethnic background. The anger feeding tourists and social movements reflects utter disillusionment with the status quo. Women everywhere have called time on one of the most egregious examples of gender inequality. Violence perpetrated by powerful women against by powerful men against women who are simply trying to do their jobs. And the anti-racist movement that has spread from the United States around the world in the aftermath of George Floyd's killing is one more sign that people have had enough. Enough of inequality and discrimination that treats people as criminals on the basis of their skin color. Enough of the structural racism and systematic injustice that deny people their fundamental human rights. These movements point to two of the historic sources of inequality in our world, colonialism and patriarchy. The global so North, especially my own continent of Europe, imposed colonial rule on much of the global South for centuries through violence and coercion. Colonialism created vast inequality within and between countries, including the evils of the transatlantic slave trade and the apartheid regime here in South Africa. After the Second World War, the creation of the United Nations was based on a new global consensus around equality and human dignity, and the wave of decolonization swept the world. But let's not fool ourselves. The legacy of colonialism still reverberates. We see this in the economic and social injustice, the rise of hate crimes and xenophobia, the persistence of institutionalized racism and white supremacy. We see this in the global trade system. Economies that were colonized are at greater risk of getting locked into the production of raw materials and low-tech goods, a new form of colonialism. And we see this in global power relations. Africa has been a double victim. First, as a target of the colonial project. Second, African countries are underrepresented in the international institutions that were created after the Second World War because before most of them had won independence. The nations that came out on top more than seven decades ago have refused to contemplate the reforms needed to change power relations in international institutions.
the composition and voting rights in the United Nations Security Council and the boards of the Bretton Woods system are a case in point. Inequality starts at the top in global institutions. Addressing inequality must start by reforming them. And let's not forget another great source of inequality in our world, millennia of patriarchy. We live in a male-dominated world with a male-dominated culture. Everywhere, women are worse off than men simply because they are women. Inequality and discrimination are the norm. Violence against women, including femicide, is at epidemic levels. And globally, women are still excluded from senior positions in governments and on corporate boards. Fewer than one in 10 world leaders is a woman. Gender inequality arms everyone because it prevents us from benefiting from the intelligence and experience of all of humanity. This is why, as a proud feminist, I have made gender equality a top priority and gender parity now a reality in top UN jobs. I urge leaders of all kinds to do the same. And I am pleased to announce that South Africa's Sia Kelizi is our new global champion for the United Nations European Union Spotlight Initiative, engaging other men in fighting the global scourge of violence against women and girls. Dear friends, recent decades have created new tensions and trends. Globalization and technological change have indeed fueled enormous gains in income and prosperity, and more than a billion people have moved out of extreme poverty. But the expansion of trade and technological progress have also contributed to an unprecedented shift in income distribution. Between 1980 and 2016, the world's richest 1% captured 27% of the total cumulative growth in income. Low-skilled workers face an onslaught from new technologies, automation, the offshoring of manufacturing, and the demise of labor organizations tax concessions, tax avoidance, and tax evasion remain widespread. Corporate tax rates have fallen. And this has reduced resources to invest in the very services that can reduce inequality. Social protection, education, health care. And the new generation of inequalities goes beyond income and wealth to encompass the knowledge and skills needed to succeed in today's world. Deep disparities begin before birth and define lives and early death. More than 50% of 20-year-olds in countries with very high human development are in higher education. In low human development countries, that figure is 3%. Even more shocking, some 17% of the children born 20 years ago in countries with low human development have already died. Dear friends, looking to the future, two seismic shifts will shape the 21st century. The climate crisis, and digital transformation. Those could widen inequalities even further. Some of the developments in today's tech and innovation hubs are cause for serious concern. The heavily male-dominated tech industry is not only missing out on half the world's expertise and perspectives, it is also using algorithms that could further enhance gender and racial discrimination. The digital divide reinforces social and economic divides from literacy to health care, from urban to rural, from kindergarten to college. In 2019, some 87% of people in developed countries use the internet, compared with just 19% in the least developed countries. We are in danger of a two-speed world. At the same time, by 2050, we estimate that accelerating climate change will affect millions of people through malnutrition, malaria and other diseases, migration, and extreme weather events. This creates serious threats to intergenerational equality and justice. Today's young climate protesters are on the front lines of the fight against inequality. The countries that are most affected by climate disruption did the least to contribute to global heating. The green, the green economy, will be a new source of prosperity and employment. But let's not forget that some people will lose their jobs, particularly in post-industrial lost belts of our world. And this is why we call not only for climate action, but climate justice. Political leaders must raise their ambition, businesses must raise their sights, and people everywhere must raise their voices. There is a better way, and we must take it. Dear friends, 
the corrosive effects of today's levels of inequality are clear. We are sometimes told the rising tide of economic growth lifts all boats, but the rising inequality sinks all boats. Confidence in institutions and leaders is yielding. Voter turnout has fallen by a global average of 10% since the beginning of the 90s. And people who feel marginalized and vulnerable to arguments that blame their misfortune on others, particularly those who look or behave differently. But populism, nationalism, extremism, racism, and scapegoating will only create new inequalities and divisions within and between communities, between countries, between ethnicities, between religions. Dear friends, COVID-19 is a human tragedy, but it has also created a generational opportunity, an opportunity to build back a more equal and sustainable world. The response to the pandemic and to the widespread discontent that preceded it must be based on a new social contract and a new global deal that creates equal opportunities for all and respect the rights and freedoms of all. This is the only way that we will meet the goals of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, the Paris Agreement and the Addis Ababa Action Agenda, agreements that address precisely the failures that are being exposed and exploited by the pandemic. A new social contract within societies will enable young people to live in dignity, will ensure women have the same prospects and opportunities as men, and will protect the sick, the vulnerable, and minorities of all kinds. Education and digital technology must be two great enablers and equalizers. As Nelson Mandela said, and I quote, education is the most powerful weapon we can use to change the world. As always, he said it first. Governments must prioritize equal access from early learning to education. Neuroscience tells us that preschool education changes the lives of individuals and brings enormous benefits to communities and societies. So when the richest children are seven times more likely than the poorest to attend preschool, it is no surprise that inequality is intergenerational. To deliver quality education for all, we need to more than double education spending in low and middle income countries by 2030 to three trillion US dollars a year. Within a generation, all children in low and middle income countries could have access to quality education at all levels. This is possible. We just have to decide to do it. And as technology transforms our world, learning facts and skills are not enough. Governments need to prioritize investment in digital literacy and infrastructure. Learning how to learn, adapt, and take on new skills will be essential. The digital revolution of artificial intelligence will change the nature of work and the relationship between work, leisure, and other activities, some of which we cannot even imagine today. The Roadmap for Digital Cooperation, launched at the United Nations last month, promotes a vision of an inclusive, sustainable digital future by connecting the remaining 4 billion people to the internet by 2030. The United Nations has also launched GIGA, an ambitious project to get every school in the world online. Technology can turbocharge the recovery from COVID-19 and the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. Dear friends, Growing gaps in trust between people, institutions, and leaders threaten us all. People want social and economic systems that work for everyone. They want their human rights and fundamental freedoms to be respected. They want a say in decisions that affect their lives. The new social contract between governments, people, civil society, businesses, and more must integrate employment, sustainable development, and social protection based on equal rights and opportunities for all. Labor market policies, combined with constructive dialogue between employers and labor representatives, can improve pay and working conditions. Labor representation is also critical to manage the challenges posed to jobs by technology and structural transformation, including the transition to a green economy. The labor movement has a proud history of fighting inequality and working for the rights and dignity of all. The gradual integration of the informal sector into social protection frameworks is essential. A changing world requires a new generation of social protection policies with new safety nets, including universal health coverage and the possibility of a universal basic income. Establishing minimum levels of social protection and reversing chronic underinvestment in public services 
including education, health care, and internet access, are essential. But this is not enough to tackle entrenched inequalities. We need affirmative action programs and targeted policies to address and redress historic inequalities in gender, race, or ethnicity that have been reinforced by social norms. Taxation has also a role in the new social contract. Everyone, individuals and corporations, must pay their fair share. In some countries, there is a place for taxes that recognize that the wealthy and well-connected have benefited enormously from the state and from their fellow citizens. Governments would also shift the tax burden from payrolls to carbon. Taxing carbon rather than people will increase output and employment while reducing emissions. We must break the vicious circle of corruption, which is both a cause and the effect of inequality. Corruption reduces and wastes funds available for social protection. It weakens social norms and the rule of law. And fighting corruption depends on accountability. And the greatest guarantee of accountability is a vibrant civil society, including a free independent media and responsible social media platforms that encourage healthy debate. Dear friends, let's face the facts. The global political and economic system is not delivering on critical global public goods, public health, climate action, sustainable development, peace. The COVID-19 pandemic has brought home the tragic disconnect between self-interest and the common interest, and the huge gaps in governance structures and ethical frameworks. To close those gaps and to make the new social contract possible, we need a new global deal to ensure that power, wealth, and opportunities are shared more broadly and fairly at the international level. A new model for global governance must be based on full, inclusive, and equal participation in global institutions. Without that, we face even wider inequalities and gaps in solidarity, like those the fragmented global response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Developed countries are strongly invested in their own survival in the face of the pandemic, but they have failed to deliver enough support needed to help the developing world through the dangerous times. A new global deal based on a fair globalization, on the rights and dignity of every human being, on living in balance with nature, on taking account of the rights of future generations, and on success measured in human, rather economic terms, is the best way to change this. The worldwide consultation process around the 75th anniversary of the United Nations has made clear that people want a global governance system that delivers for them. The developing world must have a far stronger voice in global decision making. We also need a more inclusive and balanced multilateral trading system that enables developing countries to move up global value chains. Illicit financial flows, money laundering, and tax evasion must be prevented. A global consensus to end tax havens is essential. We must work together to integrate the principles of sustainable development into financial decision making. Financial markets must be full partners in shifting the flow of resources away from the brown and the gray to the green, the sustainable, and the equitable and the reform of the debt architecture and access to affordable credit must create fiscal space for countries to move investment in the same direction. Dear friends, Nelson Mandela said, and I quote, one of the challenges of our time is to reinstill in the consciousness of our people that sense of human solidarity, of being in the world for one another and because and through others, end of quote. The COVID-19 pandemic has reinforced this message more strongly than ever. We belong to each other. We stand together or we fall apart. Today, in demonstrations for racial equality, in campaigns against hate speech, in the struggles of people claiming their rights and standing up for future generations, we see the beginnings of a new movement. This movement rejects inequality and division and unites young people, civil society, the private sector, cities, regions, and others behind policies for peace, our planet, justice, and human rights for all. It is already making a difference. Now is the time for global leaders to decide. Will we succumb to chaos, division, and inequality? Or will we right the wrongs of the past and move forward together for the good of all? We are at the breaking point, but we know which side of history are on. Thank you.
Thank you, Secretary General, for those insightful words. The SG has kindly agreed to answer a few questions on some critical aspects of the lecture. This being a unique year, uh, we never have Q&A this year. Because of the year that it is, we will have a Q&A. These questions will be posed by Nigiwe Bikicha, who most of us know as one of our foremost journalists and who also is a trustee of the Nelson Mandela Foundation. For those who don't know her, Nigiwe was the senior news anchor. She is a Fulbright Hubert H. Humphrey Fellow and holds an MA in journalism and media studies from the University of Witwatersrand. And recently, she obtained her MSc degree in African studies from the University of Oxford. Many of these questions have come from Twitter and other social media platforms as part of an effort to increase engagement and dialogue over the lecture. I'd like to hand over to you, Nigiwe. And thank you so much, Cicillo, for that kind introduction. Well, a bold call then from the United Nations Secretary General on the occasion of the 18th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. He's called for a new social contract and a new global deal. Let's delve into some of the themes that he's raised as he joins me now in, uh, co in conversation. Secretary General, good day and thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure. As a rapid response to COVID, we've seen a number of nation states take on unexpected and unplanned levels of debt. Now, in many cases, it's clear that this is going to be unsustainable for those countries. And there are parallels, Secretary General, I'm sure you'll agree, to the debt crisis that many crises, that many countries in uh, the global south faced decades ago. Secretary General, are debt write-offs possible as we move past the pandemic? Well, they are possible and necessary. Uh, uh, the G20 recognized uh, in its uh, meeting, in its uh, summit, that, uh, of course, uh, countries are having big losses in their income, uh, their fiscal income. The expenditure is increasing because the needs to respond to the COVID to uh, diminish the negative impact, uh, uh, social impact in the economies and in the societies. And at the same time, uh, many countries have very high levels of debt. So there is a, a dramatic situation that needs to be faced. There was a decision of the G20 uh, to um, have a suspension in the payment, in the payments related to debt for the least developed countries, the poorest countries in the world until the end of the year. Now, this is clearly not enough. We need more time, but many other countries have the same problem and need to be addressed. Uh, there will be uh, this weekend a meeting of the Minister of Finance of the G20, I hope, and the, and the central bank governors, I hope that uh, the consultations that we made will allow this to change. But uh, uh, in, in our opinion, and since the beginning, we have been asking for several things. First, uh, in line uh, with uh, what President Cyril Ramaphosa and the African leaders have uh, clearly stressed uh, a few months ago, uh, we need not only to uh, suspend payments in relation to the debt of low, the lowest income countries, but all developing and middle-income countries that have no easy access to financial markets and not able to service their debt. Mm -hmm. And second, we need to look seriously into the need of debt, debt relief uh, to a number of countries in which there is no sustainability for their debts. Uh, so first, suspension of payments. Second, debt relief for those that effectively need it. And then third aspect, we need to look seriously into the structure of the, uh, the debt architecture. And I believe that uh, some structural measures need to be taken in order to avoid a situation in which a series of countries in, uh, in insolvency might trigger uh, a global depression with very dramatic circumstances. So debt alleviation of the developing world is not only in the interest of the developing countries, it is in the interest of everybody. We must preserve the stability of financial sectors and we must address the debt crisis before it becomes a dramatic problem with that are devastating for the world economy. And at the same time, it's a matter of justice. The people of those countries, in many circumstances, have not even a responsibility in what has happened, and they absolutely need 
to be supported. And for that support to be possible, we need not only debt relief, but we need much more liquidity available for the developing world. And that is why, for instance, we have been since the beginning advocating for uh, issuing new special drawing rights, the modern way to print money, uh, uh, and to distribute those drawing rights to the countries in need as a way to create the conditions for the transfer of resources that is essential for the developing world. If you look at developed countries today, they are spending trillions to respond to the COVID and to boost their economies. But Africa, to do the same, would need to do a, I would say, something uh, equivalent to 10% of the African economy would need a transfer of 200 billion uh, US dollars, more than 200 billion US dollars. So we need debt relief, but we also need massive support direct support to the developing world to respond to the COVID and at the same time to be able to address the dramatic impacts in their economies and their societies. That is, of course, worsened by the inequalities existing and by the fact that in the developing world, the informal economy has a much bigger share of the, uh, the global product. Extraordinary and absolutely necessary measures, as, as you say. In your lecture, SG, you have described how the COVID-19 pandemic has laid bare risks that we had ignored for decades, such as underinvestment in healthcare, as well as inadequate healthcare system broadly. What is your call today, um, Secretary General, to governments globally and the private sector specifically um, on tackling the pandemic in ways which won't re-entrench the disparities which you have so um, described. Address the fragilities that were demonstrated by uh, the, uh, the pandemic. One fragility is the inequality. And the central aspect of inequality is uh, the consequence of low levels of investment in public health systems and uh, in other aspects of uh, uh, the welfare state, uh, in education, in, in, in social security. It is clear that countries must make an effort to invest more, to have uh, uh, universal health coverage as an objective, and to have educational systems that work for all, and a new, a new generation of social protection uh, policies that can address the dramatic situation of those that are in more uh, poor and uh, more vulnerable conditions in societies. But for the developing countries to do it, they need support. And it is obvious that uh, that is one of the reasons I was mentioning. We need not only uh, to have a social contract within each country, we need a new global deal at global level with an effective transfer of resources to the developing world for them to be able to address those gaps. But at the same time, when building back better, it's not only addressing inequality, it's addressing other fragilities. Climate change does make, does make sense to go on distributing subsidies on fossil fuels. We need to make sure to invest essentially on the green economy. Of course, there are transitions that need to be addressed. South Africa has a, a legacy, and that legacy, of course, is based on coal. It takes time. It's complex. It needs to be. That's why I speak not only about climate uh, action, I also speak about climate justice. We need to be able to address those that will be impacted negatively by climate action. But it is essential that when building back better, we build back with inclusiveness and uh, with sustainability, addressing the problems of inequality and addressing the problems of climate change. And uh, I think we have an opportunity now, but we must make the right choices and the developed countries must express the solidarity to the developing world to allow it to do the same. Secretary General, we often speak of education as a great equalizer. You yourself have just quoted Nelson Mandela. But we see in many countries that the gap between those who are able to obtain a university education and those who can't is actually widening and deepens and multiplies that inequality. What we're also seeing is that not only does it diminish opportunities for those without uh, university education, but the latest research seems to indicate that it may have an impact on levels of happiness as well. So with that in mind, is our focus on university education creating, you think, greater chasms between people and society and, as a result, undermining the working class? I think that our focus cannot be on university education. It must be on education as a whole. When I came to government in my country, only 20% of the children had preschool education. And preschool education is probably the most important element of uh, 
uh, of the equalizer, of education as equalizer. Uh, because, uh, in, in general, rich families have the capacity to provide to their small children opportunities that poor families are not in the condition to do it. Uh, we managed in Portugal, when I was in government, to move from 20% to 80% of coverage in preschool of education. I hope that today it will be around 100%. It is absolutely essential to invest in preschool education, to invest in basic and secondary education, in the quality of education, in order to create equalizing factors that then will be reflected at university. To think that the university by itself will solve the problem, it is obvious that it won't, because it will only reproduce the inequalities of, that are already evident when people have access to that university, and the, the, what you've, you have just mentioned uh, is the proof of that. So we need to... Have a, an educational policy conceived as an equalizer and not an equal education policy that reproduces the inequalities because it serves better the children of the rich people than the children of the poor people. It serves better the rich countries than the poor countries. And that requires, of course, uh, adequate policies at the current level, but that requires also a massive investment uh, by the developed world in supporting the developing world, and not only in education, in digital literacy. Uh, in today's world is the digital divide. Mm -hmm. Devastating. That can be irreversible. So it's absolutely essential to support the developing world for a massive investment in digital literacy and digital infrastructure, for internet to get everywhere, for all schools to get internet, and for the children of the developing world to be able to benefit from the benefits of the digital economy and the digital society. Yeah. You mentioned the importance of technology, SG, as something that can either reinforce divides or accelerate change. Yet the majority of those who hold the data, which is the capital of this uh, new technological realm, are located either in the US or in China, the two major superpowers. Is it possible then to build a truly digital um, economy when power remains so concentrated in those two powers? I think we have a problem of power and we have a problem of access. Our priority at the present moment is in the access and in the capacity building. And that can be done uh, independently of the fact that uh, the technology is today dominated essentially by two countries. Or uh, uh, we need to invest massively in bringing the internet to everybody. We need to invest massively in building capacity in state institutions to use the digital economy. We need to invest massive, mass massively in, uh, dig in, uh, in uh, digital literacy. And that we can done. We can do, even if uh, there is this question of power. At the same time, we need to look into the question of power. And I think there is a risk to look into the world and to have a world divided into two blocks uh, by the two biggest economies, uh, uh, two blocks uh, with two uh, dominating currencies, two blocks with uh, uh, two digital, two internets and two digital uh, technology strategies and two artificial intelligence strategies, two trade systems, and this would be a disaster. I think we need a universal system and uh, we need uh, uh, universal rules, we need international law uh, prevailing, and we need uh, the digital world to be a factor on this. That is the reason why we launched uh, our initiative, uh, our uh, high-level panel on digital co cooperation that produced a number of recommendations. Now we have a roadmap with a number of measures, measures that are aiming at access, as I mentioned in my intervention, but also at, uh, aiming at power redistribution and governance, a governance of the digital world that brings uh, equality in the excess, but also in the use of the digital world, and that allow us to control the negative aspects of the digital world. The way digital world spreads, uh, uh, for instance, uh, today, um, uh, hate speech, uh, the way it spreads uh, racism, the way it spreads xenophobia, the way it spreads many of the things that we need to fight in our societies. We need the digital world to be a force for good, not a force for evil. And certainly one of the benefits of that technology is that you and I are able to connect in the manner in which we have today, which is absolutely fantastic given the current global crisis which forbids us from traveling around the world. One of those other benefits is that there's greater engagement on tools such as social media. So what we did this week, SG, is to ask people to send us their questions. What had they always wanted to find out from you? Let me read one of those questions now. And this question is from Mosia here in South Africa, and he poses this question for USG. As COVID continues to ravage livelihoods, economies, and lives, 
is it realistic for the SDGs to be met by 2030? Isn't it time for the global community to reconfigure the goals at September's UNGA and extend by another 10 years? Your response, sir. Well, it will be very tough. And obviously what we are witnessing today is a dramatic negative impact on economies and societies that is also having a negative impact on uh, the sustainable development goals. But the worst thing we can do is to give up. I think this only increases our responsibility to build back based on the sustainable development goals. Massive investments will be made in the world, in the developed and hopefully in the developing world. Let's organize those investments that will be made for the recovery to make sure that they are based in the principles and in the policies of the Sustainable Development Goals, that they build an inclusive economy, that they build a sustainable economy, that they go organize themselves, giving priority to education, to health care, to universal health coverage, uh, allowing at the same time to address the challenges of uh, climate change. If we do that, we can now have an acceleration to compensate for the loss. If we give up and we accept that we are going to postpone, I think we will make things worse. Of course, uh, not every country will be able to reach it. Uh, countries in conflict will have enormous difficulties. We knew that already. But we must be ambitious, and we must keep that ambition, and we must put political systems, political leaders facing their responsibilities. They need to do everything to make it work. All right. Another question from social media. What are the important lessons you have learned from your time as Secretary General while attempting to facilitate meaningful change in the world? Do we have to play the game to make meaningful change, or do you think we can do it while yelling from the periphery? That's another question from Twitter. I think we need both. First, we must play the game, but try to change the rules of the game, because the game can be a different game. Uh, and that needs, obviously, uh, a top-down approach. Uh, we need leaders that are committed, that uh, force change, uh, and we need to support those leaders. Unfortunately, in today's world, leadership and power are not always aligned. Uh, we have leadership with power and a lot of power without leadership. Uh, <laughs> it's important to align the two. Uh, uh, and that, of course, uh, requires uh, something that is very important, together with a top-down approach, a very strong bottom-up approach. Uh, the, the grassroots movements, what we have seen with the youth in relation to climate change, what we are seeing today uh, in uh, the movement of the society. Uh, the, for instance, I mentioned the, the, the dramatic questions of sexual harassment, the Me Too campaign and other similar campaigns. We have seen this fantastic anti-racist movement all over the world uh, after uh, the, the, the dramatic killing that we have witnessed uh, uh, in uh, uh, Minneapolis. We, we, uh, we see the extraordinary dynamism of uh, uh, people everywhere, of women, of uh, uh, young people, of uh, uh, the civil society, and of NGOs of all kinds, of all sorts, the human rights movements. We see a lot of uh, uh, dynamism, and we need to strengthen that dynamism. We need to facilitate vibrant societies to express themselves. We need the free press to play that role. We need the social media to, to be extremely active in this, because only with this pressure from below will those that are trying to change things, to change the rules of the game from the top, will be able to succeed. If not, the lobbies that exist, the power, the power structures that exist, the interest, entrenched interest that exists, the entrenched inequality that exists, will of course make life very difficult to all those leaders that uh, are trying to change the world in a better direction based on uh, the Agenda 2030, based on the um, climate uh, agreement, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement, based on the questions of social uh, justice in finance that were defined in the Addis Ababa um, uh, agenda. All these can only be possible if from the bottom comes a very strong pressure to force leaders to move into directions that can lead to sustainability and inclusivity, that can address inequality and the fragilities of our present world. But I hope, because I see the dynamism of that movement, I see cities, I see regions, I see even the, the private sector, the business community more and more recognizing that everybody must be in the same boat instead of the present situation in which I mentioned. Some have very nice boats and some have only some debris. <laughs> uh, to, uh, to, to rescue them. So we need to really, now that we are all in the same sea, make sure that we come all into the same boat. Mm. 
Do you think, though, uh, Secretary General, that the wealthy are interested in seeing this just and equitable new global deal that you speak of, a new social contract, when, as we know in reality, tax havens are aiding and abetting them to hide assets and fleece money from the developing world. And what is the UN doing about that? Well, I do not trust necessarily the generosity of the people. I, I trust the unlikely self-interest. It's interesting to see some of the um, big fortunes in this world, some of the richest men in the world, saying that they are not paying enough taxes. That is totally unfair, that uh, the tax systems have evolved in such a way that the, the very rich people are not paying enough taxes. So some rich people are understanding that this is becoming dangerous for everybody, that inequality brings instability, and instability is a danger for everybody. But that is uh, the reason why I, I said today that we need to fight tax evasion, money laundering, illicit flows of capital is essential, and we need to have a global consensus to end tax havens. We need to create the conditions for countries to be able to make taxes work, and for them, of course, reform tax systems at country level, but abolish tax havens and fight money laundering and fight tax evasion and illicit financial flows at global level. Africa loses more money in illicit financial flows than the money comes in official development aid. So this must be a priority, and the UN has been very actively engaged in promoting these changes together with many other institutions in the world, and we hope that sooner or later we'll be able to gain this battle. Mr. Secretary General, Mr. Antonio Guterres, thank you so much for engaging with us so um, energetically on these issues at this extraordinary moment in history where we face undoubtedly one of the biggest challenges of this century. We thank you so much for your input and your insight and for indeed accepting our invitation as the Nelson Mandela Foundation to deliver the 18th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. We're so delighted that you could join us. We're deeply honored uh, that you agreed to um, deliver the lecture this year. Of course, unfortunately, uh, due to the global crisis, you couldn't travel to South Africa. We were hoping and looking forward to hosting you at the Northwest Uni University. But indeed, we appreciate your participation today. And as a token of our appreciation as the Nelson Mandela Foundation, as well as the Board of Trustees of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, we would just like to give this bust of uh, Nelson Mandela. Um, it comes from the Batawong legacy. And hopefully, when you can travel again soon, we'll be able to hand it to you in person. Mr. Guterres, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And I express my total solidarity to the people of South Africa uh, with the courage in which the South Africans are facing this COVID and its impact, and to wish you the best success in fighting the COVID and in reestablishing your economy and your society. Thanks. And back to you, Selo. Thank you very much, uh, Secretary General, for a rich and thought-provoking lecture. And to you, Nigiwe, for engaging in what has been a stimulating questions and answer set. What is very clear for me is that humanity is confronted by a singular challenge, Secretary General. If we are to survive, you tell us, if we are to thrive, then we have to change our behaviors fundamentally. We have to do differently. As Madiba once said, sometimes in fall, it falls upon a great gener a generation to be great. You can be that great generation, he says. We have leaders with power, as you said, but not much leadership. So we are hoping that that will change. If we are to be such a generation, then we'll have to achieve what you said, has, what you have outlined for us a new global com compact for human societies. For me, such a social contract will only work if we have the following, that we have a society that draws on ancient human knowledges, that's rooted in respect for the earth and other species, that is committed to ending inequality and white supremacy in all their manifestations, and that's deter that determines not to allow anyone to be left behind. You kept on emphasizing, SG, that we must build an inclusive economy. 
inclusive societies. What a challenge, what a task it is in our hands, as Nelson Mandela said. As we draw to a close, it is time to listen to one more pre-recorded message from Mrs. Grasa Marshall. She is someone who always reminds us that one of Madiba's last public speeches concluded with a trumpet call to our generation. It is in your hands now. We are very grateful to Mam Grasa for making this message at a difficult time and for supporting the annual lecture faithfully year after year since its inception. She also needs little introduction to global audiences. She's a tireless activist for the rights of women and children in particular, has taken leadership positions for many years, both locally and internationally, and walked hand in hand with Madiba in the last phase of his life, of his life's long walk. Let's listen to her words for us today. A heartfelt thank you to Secretary General Antonio Guterres, a very good friend of Madiba and I, for his inspiring remarks on this auspicious occasion as we celebrate Mandela Day 2020. As we know, COVID-19 has exposed and deepened harsh global realities. The world is grappling with a multitude of complexities, an increase of extreme poverty and the fragility of health systems on frightening scales, a deep political and social divides and toxic structural racism, and equal power dynamics resulting in millions of women and children fighting for their survival, not just from COVID-19, but from the brutalities of their abusers in their own homes as well. The fragility of ecosystems that threaten the sustainability of the planet for future generations. As we tackle the inequality pandemic, as the Secretary General has challenged us to do, and strive to confront the weaknesses of our health systems and the inequities of our economic systems, we must also dismantle and change the social inequalities with equal vigor. As we do so, no meaningful planning about the transformation we seek can take place without having women's leadership and women's rights and well-being at the heart of these strategies. Without conscious efforts to center women and girls at the core of the COVID response and reconstruction, we risk the perpetuation of unhealthy power imbalances we have lived with for far too long and miss a critical window of opportunity to redesign human relationships into ones of mutual respect and equity. The socioeconomic approaches of previous centuries and prior decades are no longer fit for purpose. The divides of global inequality are deepening and expanding. COVID-19 is forcing us to stop and re-examine the predominant value systems of the last century and exposing a harvest of inequalities that we ourselves have sown. In the words of Madiba, I quote, like slavery in the apartheid, poverty is not natural. It is man-made and it can be overcome and eradicated by the actions of human beings, unquote. His words ring true now more than ever. We need a fundamental shift in the pace and vigor of our actions and must take a more people-centered approaches to our ways of living and benefit us all, not just a few. Our new social contract for this new era must be driven by human interest above market interest. As we commemorate Mandela Day amid this challenging season of COVID, let us take inspiration from Madiba's legacy and seize this time to dismantle the structural systemic barriers 
which reinforce inequality and the disenfranchisement. COVID-19 presents us with an unprecedented window for the regeneration of our socioeconomic landscapes and the movement towards a just, equitable, and prosperous world. Let us dare not squander this opportunity for a rebirth. As Madiba challenged us, it is in our hands. I thank you. And so with that expression of gratitude from Mrs. Grasa Michel, we come to the end of the 18th Nelson Mandela Annual Lecture. I think you'll agree with me that it has been not only a unique virtual experience that we've had, but actually it was memorable. Our thanks in the first instance to the Secretary General and his team. It has been a pleasure working with them, especially our fellow South African, Ms. Karen Locke. The lecture has provided much food for thought, and I want to assure the Secretary General that we will be taking his lines of inquiry forward through our dialogue and advocacy work. There are so many people to thank for their support, so please bear with me. Let me thank one more time President Ramaphosa, Mrs. Grasa Michel, Professor Njabulon Debele, our own, very own Nikki Webb Bikicha for contributing recorded messages and for the Q&A. Thank you for being such a constant support to the foundation in good and bad times. Without our sponsors and other institutional partners, the lecture would not have been possible. And I want to acknowledge the Hans Seidel Foundation, APSA, Vodacom, Samsung, Ford Foundation, Atlantic Philanthropies, Uber, Audi and Volkswagen, Bataung Legacy, Presidential Shirts. In addition the, to the chair of the Board of Trustees, the staff of the Nelson Mandela Foundation, um, I'd like to also thank the Grasa Michel Trust. I want to thank the SABC, Kai FM, Black Motion, Video Vision, Anant and Nilesh especially, GCIS and the team in the presidency, the MRF team for helping with recording Prof's message, and of course, all the video contributors, our commentators, Rekhotsofetse Chinake, Patronella Ngaba, Sharira Kala, Nolwazi Tusini, Otilia Ana Maunganize, Judith February, Ayabonga Kawe, Songezo Mabegde. I am, as always, grateful to the Nelson Mandela Foundation team for its commitment and hard work, especially this year in the extraordinary circumstances of a COVID-19 lockdown you've had to dig deeper than normal. And again, you rose to the occasion. The team was led by Khalil Goga, with great help from Luzu Kokoti, Neo Mohopa, Lee Davis, Figile Gama, Sylvia Graham, Vern Harris, Mandla Takata, Kirileng Nechichive, Vuiswa Nkomo, Lesiho Mafora, and of course, my second in command, Dimpo Munyaman. As I bid you farewell now, I'm delighted to unveil a song especially composed and recorded by One.org, which has artists from across the African continent. I want to stress this. This song is about Africa, by Africans. We also gear a performance we will also uh, give for a performance by our very special group, Ndlovu Youth Choir. These performances will close the proceedings. Thank you for all being here today with us. We wish you well wherever you are in the world. Go well and be healthy. Please follow your country's health and safety measures. We thank you. Everything is changed nowadays. Funny how we can't even play no more. 
It was only yesterday when we party every day. Now it's blood on the dance floor. All because of the virus. But it can't kill the power inside us to stand together and defeat Corona. Yeah. And then we are called bad. In the hand, you go to hand, yeah. Dead by things are changing. The cool, yeah, Ben Reddish way. Pas tous ceux qui font le taf Dans les hôpitaux, la tristesse sous les masques Mister Coron nous a piqué dans la face On a tous peur, quoi qu'on dise, quoi qu'on fasse On va gagner, gagner, gagner À nous la victoire, notre histoire Elle va changer, tous les jours, les soirs C'est la messe, frérot, tu sais Coron nous a tous mis dans la S ah. Mothers of kings and fathers of queens You reign in your quest for the truth Don't strive in your sleep The people in your past can relate Your victory great I saw you on the ships in your graves Your fathers relate Many cries now, but they never beat the sunrise Swinging in your fight And we're waiting for your comrade Your faith gon' heal you Heaven gon' keep you I'm praying that the sun never leaves you I feel you here Hey, se não nos unirmos agora Tudo que construímos outrora Destruímos agora É melhor nos munirmos agora O futuro das crianças decidimos agora Confie, não escolhe cor Somos todos alvos Enquanto não tivemos todos Ninguém tá salvo A mensagem é básica Pra não mudarmos o nome Da mama África pra mama lágrima Lume Alfa Thank you, thank you, thank you.
continue to entertain the hope that there has emerged a cadre of leaders in my own country and region, on my continent and in the world, which will not allow that any should be denied their freedom as we were, that any should be turned into refugees as we were, that any should be condemned to go hungry as we were, that any should be stripped of their human dignity, as we were. <laughs> 